um, this is the book of Samuel, part 25. And we'll be looking at um, 1 Samuel chapter 25 from verse 1. And Samuel died. And all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house and buried him in his house at Ramah. So that Samuel died in Ramah and he was buried in the same place. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. What does that mean? That means when Samuel died, David found his way to the place to, to honor him, to attend his burial. So it was after the entire thing was over that he now left for the wilderness of Paran. Verse 2. And there was a man in Moan whose possessions were in Camel. And the man was very great and had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was sharing his sheep in Camel. Can you see that? The Bible says this man was very rich. His possession was in Camel. That means when you talk about Camel, in the land of Moan, he had the highest number of Camels. Nobody can beat him in Camels. Not only that, he had other things, but when we talk about camel, he's the strongest. He has, if you claim you have one million, then this man will have one billion. Nobody can beat him in that territory when it comes to camel, in the ownership of camel. All right, verse 3. Now, the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a good... She was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was shellish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. Now, this man called Nabal uh, came from the house of Caleb. He married a good wife, but he himself was not a good man. Can you see that? That's a, that, that, that's a terrible con combination. A good man married a bad wife. Now, look at this. If we look at this, this word critically, if you look into the family, the marriage between Nabal and Abigail, you will know that the man called Nabal was not totally bad. Are you there? He was not totally bad. Now, Nabal was a good husband. He was a good father. To be a husband has to do with the relationship between you and your wife. He was a good father because, of course, he would not have done something like this to his children. I hear that, but he was not a good, you know, he was not a good leader. Because if he had been a good leader, then what happened later in this chapter would not have happened. I hear that. So it's possible for you to be a good husband because you treat your wife well. It's possible for you to be a good father because you don't joke with your children. And it's possible for you to be a bad leader because you don't care about others. You, you, your concern is for your family, your wife, your children. That's all. In that case, you are an evil person. That means your goodness is not complete. Either, and you cannot be called a perfect man. Are you getting what I'm saying? All right. Verse 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did share his sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get you up to, Cam to Camel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. Oh, I made a mistake. Please, let's correct it. Um, let's go to verse 3 again. Um, there was a man in Moan whose possession were in camel. Now, camel is not an animal. I, I was looking at it as an animal before. It's not an animal. This camel is also is a place. Right there. The man lives in Moan, but his possession is in a place called camel in Moan. It's just like you are living in Nigeria, but you have companies abroad. 
So that means your possession is abroad, but you are living in Nigeria. I get what I'm saying. So this is it. This is what is happening here. So Moan is a place. Camel is a place. So Moan is the residential place of this man. But Camel is the official site where his company is situated. Are you getting? So please let's take note of let's take note of that. I hope you get that that part correctly. So this man was very great. Now, this is the analysis of his greatness. Now, the Bible called him very great because as at that time, he had 3,000 sheep, number one. Number two, he had 1,000 goats. That means he had 1,000 goats. Are you there? So, 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats at that time is enough to make a man great. That's what the Bible is talking about. Are you there? Because there are people who don't even have up to five goats, who don't even have up to three camels. Three, three sheep. Are you there? So let's continue. Um, we'll be going to verse, verse 4 now. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did share his sheep. So let me read verse 4 again for emphasis. The Bible says, And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did share his sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young man, Get you up to Camel and go to Nabal. Greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thy house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. That means they greeted him by referring to his family, his house, they were referring to his family. So they greeted him. They sent greetings to his family. And also they sent greetings to all that is had, his properties. All right. Meaning they honored the man. They honored the house of the man, the family of the man. And they honor all that the man has. Verse 7. And now I have heard that thou hast share us. Now thy shepherds which were with us. We ought them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them. All the while they were in Camel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thy eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever come to thy hand, unto thy servant, and to thy son David. Now, this man, Nabal, is an old man. But he, he married, <laughs> he's an old man, but he married a young wife. Do you understand? Abigail was young, but Nabal was far more older than Abigail. This was like, it's like a man of 40 marrying a girl of 20. And David, as at that time, is just 20 something. Are you there? So that kind of girl should have married someone like David. Either David at that time would be maybe 23, 24. And this wife is 20. The, and Nabal is 40. Either. That was why David was referring to him as his son. So he said, from David thy son. I see that meaning the man is old enough to give birth to him. Either. That's what it means. All right. Verse 9. And when David's young men Came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased, meaning and they stopped. And Nabal answered David's servant and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. I say that instead of Nabal to respond to them by giving them something. Actually, this was the time where David was broke. You know, he was not in the city, so he could not work for himself. So, resources are going down. He was very broke. So, he said, okay, send the message to Nabal. Nabal should be able to help us. Meanwhile, the reason David was sending the message to Nabal was because, you know, he had helped Nabal. During those periods, it was David and his men that were protecting the, sh- the goat and the sheep of Nabal. They were protecting the properties of Nabal and the servants of Nabal. They ensured that no enemy came to attack them. No enemy came to take away what they have. 
So David now thought that because of this good thing they have done, Nabal will reciprocate it by being a blessing to them. But unfortunately, <laughs> Nabal said, who is David? Can you see? You know, said, well, there are a lot of servants these days that break away from, from their servants. So to him now, David is, um, David is one of those servants who have not been faithful to their master. Verse, um, verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my sharers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? Can you see that? Nabal said, will I now take my things and give it to strangers? I don't give things to strangers, please. Verse 13. And David said unto his men, Guide thee on every man his sword. And they guided on every man his sword. And David also guided on his sword. And they went up after David, about 400 men, and 200 abode by the stock. And one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers unto out of you know David sent messengers out of wilderness to salute our master. And he railed on them. But the men were very good to us, and we were no odds. Neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the field. Can you see that? Even the shepherd of Nabal could attest to the fact that David and his men protected them and also protected the property. Verse 17. Now therefore, know and consider that what know and consider what thou will do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Even the servants know that this man who is leading us is a son of Belial. You know what it means to be son of Belial? Son of Belial means he's a son of the devil. That's what it means. Anytime they refer to somebody as the son of Belial, it means that person is of the devil. So there's a way a leader will be leading that even the led we know that this one is not of God. So in the case of Nabal, the people Nabal was leading, these were people that were collecting salary from Nabal. They addressed their master as the son of as the son of Belial. So they told his wife, We know our master is the son of Belial. And even the wife did not fight them because Abigail knew those things they were saying were true. Because at least he's the wife, so he knows the husband better than them. So if Nabal was a good person, Abigail could have said, uh -uh, don't talk to my husband like that. But Abigail kept quiet because she knew they were right. Calling his husband, calling her husband <laughs> the, the son of Belial, she knew they were right. May you not marry that kind of person. May you not have that kind of leader that the best way to describe them is to call them uh, sons of Belial. He said, now, one of the characteristics of sons of Belial is that you cannot speak to them, meaning, meaning you cannot correct them. He said, look at, look at how the, the uh, look at how verse 17, look at how verse 17 ended. Um, the Bible says, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. That means one of the signs to show that a person is the son of Belial is that he cannot be corrected. You can't speak to them and they will take to it. Never. Whether you are old or you are young or you are their age mate, they don't take to correction. If you see people that do not take to correction, I tell you the truth. You have seen a son of Belial. Verse 18. Then Abigail made east. Meanwhile, at this point now, David had already gathered himself, meaning that they wanted to go to where Nabal is and destroy everything he has. So that since he has decided to be stingy, they want to teach him a lesson by experience. Verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready, you know, five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and an hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on the asses. Now look at what Abigail took. He took 200 loaves, one, two bottles of wine, two, five sheep ready, ready dressed, three. When you say five sheep ready dressed, meaning five sheep that has been killed, 
and has been dressed. So that kind of thing, when, when it gets to David, they don't need to start killing the sheep. It has been killed already. All they need to do is to just cook and eat. And in most cases, all they need to do is just to eat it. Because since it's dressed, that means uh, the season, the maggi, the pepper, everything has been added to it. So she picked five sheep ready dressed. She also picked five measures of parched corn. That's not all. She picked an hundred cluster of raisin. She also picked 200 cakes of figs. Let's count it. Number one, 200 loaves. Number two, two bottles of wine. Number three, five sheep ready dressed. Number four, five measures of parched corn. Number five, 100 clusters of raisins. Number six, 200 cakes of figs. Can you see that? This is what the man is supposed to have done. But because he's a son of Belial. So sons of Belial don't know the right thing to do. That's the second thing. I'm giving you signs so that maybe somebody, maybe the closest person to you is qualified to carry that identity. You know how to beware. Either you know how to be careful of such a person. Some of us, we have surrounded ourselves with sons of Belial. Those we call friends are sons of Belial for some of us. Verse 19. And she said unto her servant, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. Why didn't she tell her husband? Because he, he married a son of Belial. Even Abigail marrying the man, she's frustrated already. The only consolation she had in that family is that, okay, she married a rich man. That's all. Some of you want to marry rich people. You want to marry a rich girl. You want to marry a rich man. It's good. But just make sure that rich person is not the son of Belial. He's not a son of Belial. Make sure that rich girl is not a daughter of Belial. Because the same Belial that has son also has daughter. There are daughters of Belial and there are sons of Belial. So don't be moved by the physical glittering things you see. Are you there? Let the fear of God move you. Move you. Are you with me? Now, at this time, David was already planning to go and destroy Nebah. That was why Abigail was preparing in a rush so that they can meet up with David. Okay, verse 20 now. First Samuel 25, verse 20. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Can you see that? The men came down against her, meaning that, now that word against her does not mean they came to fight her, no. It means they came to her in an opposite direction. Are you there? She is coming, uh, uh, she is coming from, it's just like somebody coming from the north, are you there? And also somebody coming from the south. So both of them met at the center. Are you there? So the word they came down against her does not mean they came to fight her. It means um, both of them were in the opposite. You know, both of them were facing each other. They were opposite each other. Now, verse 21. And David said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow at in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him. And he had recruited me evil for good. Now, this was the complaint that um, David was making. said, I ensured that nothing bad happened to the animals of this man, your husband. I kept the flock, kept the shepherd. We were acting like security guards. But unfortunately, your husband could not compensate us. In time of need, we need food. Which we know that your husband can give, but look at what your husband did to us. Verse 22. So, and more so, do God unto the enemies of David, if I live of all that pertained to him by the morning light. Any that pieceth against the wall. Can you see that? Now, any that pieceth against the wall is talking about animals. Because it's, it's animals that does that. So, David was saying, anything that Nabal has, that is a living thing, will die before tomorrow ends. That's what David is saying. <clears throat> Just century. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, 
and bowed herself to the ground. Can you see that? She, she was humble. Now, Abigail married Nabal. Nabal was a great man. So, who is Abigail? Abigail is also a great woman. That's just what it means. If your husband is a great man, you have to be a great woman too. So, for her to bow and fall to her knees before David, that is humility. I hear so prosperity minus humility we only hand you in humiliation to hand you in frustration either it will hand you in lack because sooner or later all that you have gathered you lose it <clears throat> verse 24 and fell at his feet and said upon me my lord upon me let this iniquity be and let thy heart made i pray thee speak in thy audience and hear the voice of thy heart made so the wife fell to her you know, fell to her knees and began to plead. They said, please, this sin, let it be upon me. Don't look at my husband. Please just look at me. See me as the one who have done something wrong to you. Verse 25. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial. Can you see that? The servant called Nabal, a son of Belial. <laughs> the wife also referred to him as a son of Belial. Meaning that is actually a son of Belial. Even Nabal, can you see that? For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thy handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. So the woman was saying, I'm sorry. I did not see the people you sent to us. If I had seen them, would I have allowed this, my foolish husband, to attend to them? If I had seen them, I would have personally attended to them. So the woman was apologizing. Verse 26. And now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord that withholding thee from coming to shed blood, from avenging thyself with thy own hand, now let thy enemies, and they that seek evil to my Lord, be as neighbor. Can you see that? So this woman is trying to please the king. He was, he was trying to please um, David. He, there, he, said, no, he said, David, let your enemies be as neighbor. Meaning, let your enemies become the sons of Belial. That's what he's saying. Verse 27. And um, it's good for you to note that. Let your enemy be as neighbor. It's also the same thing as let your enemy be set up for destruction. Because obviously... <laughs> If you are a son of Belial, you are you have already registered for destruction, whether you know it or you don't. All right, verse twenty-seven. And now this blessing which thy handmaid had brought unto my Lord, let it be, let it be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. Can you see that? I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy handmaid. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighted battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Can you see? This woman was a wise woman. Look at the way he's talking to David. He knew the problem of David. He knew at that point David did not have a house. Based on the troubles, he had to hide in this cave, in that cave. So he said, my Lord, I know that the Lord will give you a house. Can you see that? He has, she has deviated from the point now. Aide, she's now she saw the need. Aide, she saw the need of David that she cannot meet. Uh, she cannot meet. Sorry. Aide, the need of David that she can meet was the food, the drink. She met that one. But the need of David that she cannot meet is the, the you know the house matter. She knows she cannot at that point she cannot build a house for David. That may not be because she can, but because there's no way she will do that and her husband we don't know. But she now said, the Lord will certainly give you a house because you are fighting the battle of the Lord. Can you see that? Any need you cannot give, you cannot supply, you can intercede for. Are you there? You have a friend who is hungry and that same friend also have not paid his school fees. Are you there? You have food, but you don't have the money to pay the school fee. Give the friend the food you have. 
cure hunger, then intercede for his school fee. Intercede for a school fees. Are you getting what I'm saying? So any need you cannot meet physically is what you are supposed to intercede for. That should form the prayer point you will pray for that person. Are you getting what I'm saying? All right. <clears throat> Verse 29, yet a man is risen to pursue thee and, and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be, shall be born in the, in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thy enemies shall, be, shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. Can you see that? The, king was, the, the woman was now saying, your enemies that want to kill you will not be able to kill you. They are the ones that will die. Can you see that? He's now, now look at what she's doing. She prayed. Now the next thing she's doing is to affirm the promises of God for David. Are you there? She began to speak to help David remember what God had told him. This is wisdom. Verse 30. And it shall come to, and it shall come to pass when the Lord shall shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he had spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. Can you see that? Abi, you see, Abigail is not just a wife. She was a prophetess. The Bible may not describe her as one, but she was a prophetess. She was able to see the future of David. She said, it will come to pass. In that day when the Lord will have made you a king over Israel. As at that time, David was running from one place to another. As a matter of fact, he does not even have a house. Yet, Abigail is saying, a time, when, a time will come when the Lord will make you king over Israel. Only, you know, prophetic insight can, can, can bring up such a detail. Are you there? Because this is the... This is the first meeting. This is the first meeting between David and Abigail. So it's not like Abigail is very close to David to know all those things. So she's speaking by spiritual insight. And she's at that point she's operating with uh, the gift of prophecy. Are you there? The gift of prophecy and also word of knowledge. That's what she's operating with. So she's not just a wife, she's a prophetess. If you are listening to me and you are a female, don't just be a wife. Are you there? Be a prophetess. Be the, be the prophetess of your house. And if you are listening to me, you are a male. You are not exempted. Don't just be the husband. Are you there? Be a prophet. Be the, be the prophet of your house. Alright, let's continue. Verse 31. That this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood costless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thy handmaid. Can you see that? She was now saying, of course we, I know that you become the king. But please, sir, when you become the king, don't forget me. This was a great woman. See, at that, as at that time, Abigail was greater than David. That's the truth. So all these things Abigail is saying, she's talking by prophecy. She's talking by a kind of spiritual insight. Are you there? It's just like the person that employed you. Maybe you are a new staff. You are collecting. Maybe the person is giving you 100000 per month. And your boss is somebody that pays more than 50 people every month. Different salary scale. Are you there? Your boss is... Let's assume your boss is a millionaire. So you are just earning maybe 100,000 per month. Your boss now called you and said, in that day when you become the president of Nigeria, please, don't forget to help me. Only prophetic insight can make him say that. Why? Because at that time, as, as at that time when he's speaking, he's far greater than you. This is what is happening between Abigail and David. Are you there? So as at that time, Abigail was far greater than David. But Abigail could see his future. So is, she spoke in that direction. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which hath sent 
D, this day to meet me. Can you see that? When you speak the right word, you attract blessings. Are you there? When you speak the wrong word, you can attract a curse. Abigail attracted blessing because she spoke the right word. Learn to speak rightly. It pays. It pays. Blessed be thy advice. Blessed be thou. Which, blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. Can you see that? So, David blessed three things. He blessed the day, he blessed the advice of the woman, and he blessed the woman. So when you, when you speak wrongly to, the day you did that thing can be cursed. That thing you said can be cursed. And you, the speaker, can also be cursed. So there are three things that can be cursed. The day of the occurrence, Either the occurrence itself and the person promoting the occurrence. Are you getting what I'm saying? Please take note of that. Verse 34. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou had hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light, any that pieces against the world. So David was now saying, thank God you came. If you had not come, by this time tomorrow, Nabal will not have, he will not have one like this, one animal still standing. Because the plan was to kill all his animals. So David received of a hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, go up in peace to thy house. See, I have akin to thy voice, and I have accepted thy person. So David accepted the gift because he accepted the person. Are you there? So there is a giver, there is the gift, there's the receiver. If your receiver is God, he will not accept your gift until you, the giver, is accepted by him. So David said, I have accepted your gift because I have accepted your person. So God will first accept the person before accepting the gift of the person. So if you bring a gift to God and God accepted your gift, it's a sign that you have first been accepted. So if you are not accepted, it doesn't matter the quality of what you are bringing, it will be rejected. Are you there? Okay. Verse 36, And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, n- nothing less or more, until the morning light. Can you see that? When Abigail got to Nabal <laughs> already threw a feast. He was throwing a party. Are you there? They were eating. He brought visitors. People were drinking wine. That's foolishness. Those that helped you, you did not pay them. You did not compensate them. Now you are throwing a feast. That's foolishness. And this is how some some bosses, this is how they, they act. They will be owing salary, yet they will be doing birthday for their children. That is that is wickedness. People that are working for you have not yet been paid. You are buying a car. People that are working for you have not yet been paid. You are traveling abroad on vacation. That's witchcraft. People like that are like Nabal, sons of Belial. When you have son, when you have a son of Belial as your boss in your place of work, you are in trouble because they won't pay your salary, and yet they can use, they can go and buy a wristwatch that can pay five people's salary, whereas they have people that they can buy something that can pay all the salary. They won't care. Are you there? They, 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 okay, for instance, somebody needs one million to pay the salary of all his staffs, and the same person is holding salary, yet he went ahead to buy a car of 16 million for cruising. That person is a son of Belial, and that's the spirit of Nabal. Do you not carry that kind of spirit in the name of Jesus? All right, verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning 
when the wine was gone out of Nabal. And his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and it became as a stone. Can you see that? So Abigail waited for the, for the, for the wine to, to clear from his face. And I went to tell him, you better thank your God that I went to meet David. By now, all this feast you are doing now, you, after your feasting, you will now be crying. Because by now, all that you have will have been cleared. And the Bible says, Nabal became like a stone, meaning he was very scared. Verse, 30, verse 38. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. Who killed Nabal? The Lord. Why? Because of his wickedness. That's it. It was not David that killed Nabal. God himself killed him. Don't try to revenge. From, don't try to revenge yourself, you know, from your enemies. Let God do it. Either if you kill your enemy by yourself, you, you become guilt, guilty of murder. But if you let God do it, you are righteous. So let's learn from this story. Verse 39. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servants from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and commoned with Abigail to take her to him to wife. So David now went to speak to Abigail. Can you marry me now that your, see your wicked husband is dead? Somebody say, uh-uh, is it supposed to be like that? That's, that's wrong. No. In those days, it's the right thing to do. Are you there? Even till now, you can, it is, it, you know, you can marry a woman whose husband is dead. It's only the one that divorced that uh, you have to be careful. Well, if the husband is dead, you can marry the woman. Are you there? Because marriage bonds, one of the things that can dissolve marriage bonds is death. That's why the, there's this statement, till death do us part. So the only thing that can part you, can separate you after being married is death. Is, is death. Are you there? May you not die untimely. May God keep you and your partner. May God keep you and your marriage. May God keep you and your future partner. For those of you who are yet to come into a relationship. For those of you who are in a relationship, may God keep you and your partner. And if you are already married, may God keep you and your husband. May God keep you and your wife. In the name of Jesus. Verse 40. And when the servants of David came to Abigail, to Carmel, they spoke unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee, to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed her face, and bowed herself, on her face to the earth, and said, Behold, let thy hand made be a servant to wash the feet of my Lord. Meaning she agreed to marry David. And Abigail hasted and rose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. And David took High, high Noam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. So that means at this point, David had two wives. The first one is the High Noam. That High Noam is from Jezreel, and the second is Abigail. Now, verse 44, which is the last verse. But Saul had given Micah, his daughter, David's wife, to Farti, the son of Laish which was of Galim. Can you see wickedness? You know, for, for some time, probably years, David have not been at home. So what David did, you know, what Saul, the father of Michael, did, the father of Michael did, was to give Michael to another man for marriage. Instead of him to say, okay, wait for your husband, he married her daughter to another man. This same son collected 204 skins. I hope you still remember. Now, she he married the daughter to another person. What, what can you see from that? The original intention was not for the good of David. He, he gave him his daughter so that she can serve as a trap to him. But God turned it around. So, David left home. The father took Micah. 
and marry that to another man. Can you see that? You know, I was telling you, I said, Mika originally too did not really love David. That's the truth. What Mika loved was the fame, was the glory of David. The fact that, ah, this man killed Goliath. That's what enticed Mika. Because if not for that, she would not have agreed to do that. And if she refused to marry any other person, the king cannot do anything to her because she's the daughter of the king. The king cannot kill her. So it means that the love originally was not on a good note. It was not for a good reason. It was a flashy kind of love. Ah, you know, so that she can be moving, Mika can be moving and say, do you know my husband? I don't know him. He's the one that killed Goliath. Eh, 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 ah. Hey, mommy, ah, we have to be honoring you now. Ah, your husband is a great man. That's what Mika wants. That was what steered the love in the heart of Mika for David in the first place. This is why it is wrong to, to love or to marry for the wrong reasons. Because the marriage will not last. You know, it was easy for many to take wrong advice because the reason for their love was not genuine. People like Mika, they can marry you and still leave you because the reason for that love is not genuine. This is the book of Samuel, part 26. I will be looking at 1 Samuel, chapter 26, from verse 1. And the Ziphite came to Saul, to Geber, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakila, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having three thousand chosen men of Israel with him, to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Aquila, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. Verse 4, David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul was come in a very Saul was come in very deed. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the captain of his host. And Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. So this time around, um, as usual, the king was not tired. He will act like he has repented, but before you know it, he's changing David again. So this time around, as usual, he came also with um, the thousands of men to look for David. Are you there? Now, meanwhile, when David knew that, you know, that Saul is doing such thing, he sent out spies. So, and those spies did a very good job by informing David of the exact spot where Saul is. All right. Verse 6. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech, the Ishtite, the Etite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeruah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul, to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spears stuck in the ground that is bolster, you know, and his, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abina and the people lay round about him. So, you know, um, David asks his people, who will follow me? Of course, he does not want to go alone. At least two of them, two or three of them is fine. Since they are not going to fight, they just want to go and uh, verify some things. So um, Abishai was bold enough to say, I will go with thee. And the moment he volunteered himself to go, the deed was done. So they went there in the night. By the time they got there, they found out that uh, Saul was sleeping. And then all the men that came with him too, 
they were also sleeping. So <laughs> those that were supposed to be awake guarding the king, they were also sleeping around the king. So it's more or less like they form a circle. Everybody was sleeping, but the king was in the middle. Are you there? But the formation does not matter. A sleeping soldier is more or less a useless soldier because he cannot watch and he cannot fight. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, all right, verse 8. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thy enemy unto thy hands this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. So Abishai, when he saw Saul sleeping, and he saw his men sleeping, he now said, See, Master, God has delivered your enemy to your hands. Please let me smite, let me smite him. I will not do it the second time. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying that he's sure he will not miss his target. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, okay, please let me do it. Don't worry, I won't do the next one. No, he's, he's saying that to show that he's very sure that he doesn't need to eat salt twice before he dies. He's so sure of his skill. So one of the things to note about Abishai is that Abishai was a man of war. Abishai was a skillful man. So one who does not need to throw spear twice. Once is enough and it will hit the target. All right. I pray thee with the spear. If, okay. All right. And I will not smite him twice. Okay, let's go to verse 9. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, for his day shall come, for his day shall come to die, for he shall descend into battle and perish. So from here now you can see the prophetic dimension of David's statement. So David told Abishai not to try it. David said, you can't kill the Lord's, the Lord's anointed and not be guilty. That's what some of you do not know. You know this person is a minister of God, yet you are cheating on him. Are you there? You know this person is a minister of God, yet you are not faithful to him. You know this person is a minister of God, yet you are not open to him. You are deceptive around him. You cannot do such things to God's anointed and not be guilty. That's what David is saying here. David, a man of the Old Testament, understands this. But we, we are shouting, we are New Testament, we are new this, new believer, new generation, new... We are just using the word new, new, new to show we are different. Yet, those in the hold are even better. So you must understand that uh, there's a way to, to live with those that are anointed. Don't be too familiar with them. On, uh, uh, you know, otherwise, that your familiarity can land you in trouble. Don't be too familiar with the anointed. Don't rob them. Don't steal from them. Be truthful around them. Be open to them. Because you cannot do anything different from this to them and not be guilty. It's not possible. That's what David is saying here. So suddenly, David began to speak prophetically. David now said, Don't worry, leave him. It's time to die. will soon come. He will go to battle. And in that battle, he will die. That's what David said. That thing David was saying was prophetic. Because he was saying it by the Spirit of God. And if you study this story, you discover that that was how Saul died. He went to battle and he died there. Meanwhile, David had prophesied the death, the exact thing that we happened to Saul in this chapter. Leave him, don't kill him. He will soon, it's time to die, it's near. He will soon go to war and he will die there. And that was what happened to him. So your words are powerful. Either what you say can become what you see. What you say to your enemies can become their realities. What you say to your friends, your children, your family members can become what you see in them. So please be careful of what you say. We need to learn from David. Verse 11. 
The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let's go. So David, what he does is each time he comes around Saul, he will take something that he can show as an evidence. So this time around, they took, uh, they took the. Let's look at the things that was, that was taken. Number one, they took the spear. They took his spear. Are you there? They took his spear, and also they took his water cruise. Now that what that water cruise is like a, it's like a container where the soldiers put water. You know, they can be fighting and they are thirsty. They can be walking and they are tired. So you just take their water cruise and you know drink water from there. So this time around, David said, take his spear and take his water cruise. So by that we we are telling him that we came home, but we spear him and he's doubting us. We'll show him his spear and we'll show him his water cruise. Then he will believe that we actually came, but we did not kill him. Verse 12. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster and they got them away and no man saw, saw it nor knew it neither awaked for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was falling upon them. Can you see that? God wanted the operation of David to be successful. What did he do? He allowed the people to sleep deeply. See, when God has a hand in what you are doing, Everything will work well for you. When God has a hand in what you are doing. See, God has a hand in that movement. So, God deliberately, you know, made all of them to sleep. They could not control the sleep. They could not fight it. Has it ever happened to you before? You want to sleep, but you could not control it. You were trying to fight the sleep, but at last, you slept off. That's what I'm saying. All right. Verse, verse 13. And David went over to the other side and stood on top of an hill afar off, a great space being between them. Can you see that? So David went very far away from where Saul was. Because if he had stayed close, of course you know Saul. Saul would have tried shooting an arrow at him. So he went afar off. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Nair, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that cries to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept the Lord, you know, why, 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 wherefore then hast thou not kept thy Lord, the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king, thy Lord. So David said, Abner, I, I thought you are the most skillful man in Israel. I thought you are the best when it comes to war in Israel. Why is it that somebody now came to your king and yet you were not even aware? David was mocking them. Verse 15. And David said to Abner, Okay, I've read that. Verse 16. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is. <laughs> And the cruise of water that was at his bolster. So David said, ah, ah, You cannot even keep the king. And you are getting collecting salary. You deserve to die. Now look at the spear of the king with me now. Eh? Look at his, uh, his water cruise with me. Eh? How did they get to me? He was making jest of them, he was mocking them. Verse 17 And Saul knew David's voice and said, is this thy voice, my son, David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. 
say one of the most pre- pre- pretending personality I've seen in my life in the scripture is Saul. Look at the tone he used to give. Oh, is that my son David? Is your son David, and yet you want to kill him? What a deception. Verse 19. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has steered thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Can you see that? So David said, well, if it is the Lord that has asked you to be chasing me, then uh, maybe we should offer sacrifice to him. But if it is human beings who have deceived you to this point where you are restless, you are trying to kill me, then those people are cursed. Verse 20, And now therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel is come out to seek a flea, as when one doeth on a partridge in the mountain. David said, the king is now looking for a flea. So David was, uh, you know, David was refined to himself as a flea, a very small insect. So David is saying, now the king is restless, looking for a small boy like David. Verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thy eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool, and I, and I have cried exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. So the king said, Ah, David, don't worry, come home. I will no longer try to hurt you again. Immediately David said, Well, look at the spear of the king. Look at the water cruise of the king. One of you should come and take it. Can you see that? Verse 23. The Lord rendered every man the Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life, as much set by this day in my hands, in my eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord. Let him deliver me out of all tribulation. So David said, well, the same way I saw you now, I'm supposed to kill you, but I did not kill you. Let my God also spare me. Let my God also deliver me. He did not say, well, king, eh, the same way I did not kill you like this. Please make sure he did not kill me too. No, he was not trying to find favor before the king. He said, the way I have kept you, my God, you also keep me. The way I have not killed you before your time. My God, we not also allow the devil to kill me before my time. Verse 25, which is the last verse. And Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son, David. Thou, hast, thou shalt both do great things, and also shall still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Can you see that? People may call you their son. But I tell you the truth, not too many people understand what it means. My son, my son, can they sacrifice for you? Don't be deceived. Are you there? I used to say something. It looks so funny, but that's the truth. It is only God that you are sure of. Only God loves you sincerely. Don't move by what people are saying. You can be sure of God's love, but any other person's love... You have to discern. When it comes to God's love for you, you don't need to discern. But people's love, please discern. You can be deceptive. Oh, my daughter, my daughter. And you are having issue with your school fees. They cannot help you. They cannot help you. No money, no money. They are pushing it for their biological children. But anytime they see you, they, they shout, my daughter. Don't mind them. I have, I've had a lot of 
experienced like that before. Till I come to that conclusion. Only God loves me. When it comes to humans, I have to discern the love. There's, not, there's no name they won't call you. Don't let it move you so that your heart will not break. Most people say what they don't mean. That's one thing you must understand. People in this world, they say what they don't mean. Is your son. Is your son. If he's truly your son, the same labor you are, you are ready to give to your biological children, you should be able to give to that person. If I call you a son, I'm saying it, I'm, what I'm saying is beyond the fake pronouncement that people make. What, when I call you a son, what it means is the same thing I can do to my biological children as God gives me is the same thing I can do to you. If I say my son, it means if there is something to pay for and my biological children also has, maybe you have a school fee to pay for and my biological ch- ch- a, a child also has a school fee to pay for, because I call you my son, I can divide the money into two, give half to my biological children and give the remaining half to you who is my spiritual child. Why? Because I have called you by that name. But it's not true to everybody. People call you by names that is not even real to them themselves. Don't say what you cannot sacrifice for. Are you there? Don't call people names that you don't mean. By so doing, you'll be giving them false hope. Ah, I really suffered from this thing when I was growing up as a young child. You know, being a young boy that loves the Lord, being a, lo- a young boy that has the fear of God, so several people lost me. And you hear them say, my son, my boy, my boy, my son. I, I, I heard that name from so many people. Until I got frustrated one day, I said, no, only God loves me, only God. My son, and those periods when I have issues, they know I have issues. In that issue, they will still be saying, my son, my son. Yet yeah, they cannot do anything. Even when they have, they can't do it. I see some of them, when I have issues with my school fees, I see some of them still shouting, my boy, my son, there's no money. There's no money with me. You know, there's no money. Things are hard. In that things are hard, they are sending their children to school. In that things are hard, they are doing a lot of things for their family. But in that things are hard, they cannot give 1,000 naira to the one they are saying, my son. Maybe you are in that shoe now and you are even frustrated. You are confused. You are, you are bitter. You are angry. You say, what sort of, please, you don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be angry. Are you there? Only God loves you. When it comes to the confessions of love from people, you have to discern. When people talk about love, discern them. Until you have rightly discerned, don't believe them. Because they will break your heart. Many people will call you my son. Many people will call you my daughter. And yet, they are not ready to sacrifice anything for you. Are you there? May I never say what I don't mean. I tell you the truth in the Holy Ghost. If I call you my son, if I call you my daughter, by implication it means the same sacrifice I can do to myself, I can do to you. Are you there? As a matter of fact, if I have one biro, are you there? And my biological child needs a pen and my spiritual child needs a pen the one i'm calling my son my daughter i will give that one pen to that my spiritual son or my spiritual daughter yes my biological one can 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 you know can get you know can scout for things and get it you can i can ask my biological one to go to the mother because i i know the lord has blessed her too I either but that one that i have that little one i can give it to my spiritual children that's to show you the level of sacrifice. Because once I begin to call you my son, my daughter, I see you the same way as my biological children. That's what I'm saying. Not these fake, not these fake things people say. I'm telling you this because just in case you are still young, you will know how to live your life. Don't say what you don't mean. Don't say, my friend, when you are not when you are not ready to pay the price. I, I, I hope you have learned from David and Jonathan. Don't say you are my friend. When you are not ready to lay down your life for your friend. When you are not ready to, to live like David and Jonathan. Are you getting what I'm saying? Don't say, don't say my father and the Lord when you are not ready to submit. Don't be fake. Be real. Are you there? If you cannot submit to a person as your father and the Lord, just, don't say, ah, my friend. Are you there? Or just say, ah, somebody I honor. Don't, say, don't come and say my father and the Lord. 
Don't say what you don't mean. Many people say a lot of big things. Big things that they have not even grown into. So they, they end up looking like fake individuals. Please don't be too fast to say big things. If you say this person is my father in the Lord, please live worthy of it. Submit to the person. You say somebody is your father in the Lord, is giving you instruction, you are, you, are, you, you are contemplating. He's telling you something, you don't even believe him. It's your father in the Lord, you are not listening to his messages. You are just there on your you are just moving around. Please, let's be real. Enough of these fake things we are doing. Don't say the big things you are not ready for. And it is better to say small things that you can do than to say big things that you cannot do.